Cantrell is the founder and executive director of the Factory Farming Awareness Coalition, or FFAC. After graduating from UC Berkeley in 2009, she founded FFAC and has since given more than 150 presentations uh, about factory farming at venues, including Stanford, Yale, and the National uh, Natural Resource Defense Council. Her presentations have been used as a resource for food justice activists across the country. So, if you could please welcome Katie. All right, thank you so much. So, before we get started, if I could just get a sense of who's all, who all is in the room with us today. So, how many of you are veg or vegan? Oh, wow. Okay, awesome. <laughs> How many of you consider yourselves activists or advocates? Okay, cool. Good to know. Just, we talked to lots of different types of people, so I want to make sure this talk is as useful for you as possible. So, again, my name is Katie Cantrell. I'm the founder and executive director of the Factory Farming Awareness Coalition. We're a national nonprofit. We now have nine chapters, and I'm based here in Portland. So today I'm going to be talking to you about how we can be more effective activists or advocates. And I'll start off giving you a bit of background about myself and about the organization, and then we'll talk about some different things that might keep us from being as effective as possible when talking to people about these different issues. So um, it seems like most of us are already veg, so we probably already know about the issue of factory farming. People. So my organization, we, we go out and talk to um, students, community groups, people of all different ages and backgrounds about the impacts of our food choices. And a lot of times people will say, well, are you kind of preaching to the choir? Don't people know about this already? But it's shocking, but most people, you know, they might know that McDonald's, they have some vague idea that McDonald's and fast food doesn't come from a great place. But most people have absolutely no idea that 99% of animal products in the United States come from factory farms. And they also don't understand the scale of the problem. So we start off our presentations by asking people to guess how many animals are bred and killed for food every year in the United States. Most audiences guess maybe 50 million, 100 million, and as many of you probably know, the answer is 9 billion. 9 billion animals raised and killed for food every year in the United States alone. And this is really what motivated me to get involved. So when I was in college, I joined an animal advocacy group on campus. We would do leafleting, food giveaways, movie screenings, all that awesome stuff. And it was great, and it was effective at reaching certain people. But I came to realize that, you know, when I would be leafleting, sometimes people would say, oh, no, thanks, I don't care about animals, or animals aren't my thing. And at first I thought, you know, who are these monsters? <laughs> who doesn't love animals? What's wrong with these people? But eventually I came to realize that these are people who care about the environment, they care about social justice, or they're just too stressed out and overwhelmed trying to go to class and take basic care of themselves. They don't have the mental or emotional energy to take on yet another cause outside of what they've already got going on in their own lives. And once I came to realize that, I wasn't judging these people anymore. I was empathizing with them because I myself had done that. You know, there were other people talking about, like, uh, like labor organizing on campus or talking about, you know, starving children in third world countries. And I didn't give them the time of day because I was so busy with my animal advocacy work that, you know, I just didn't have time for another cause. And so once I realized that, um, well, I should say the other, the other part was I read Eating Animals by Jonathan Safran Foer, a um, really fantastic book that I highly recommend. And in there he talks not just about animals, but about the full range of issues that are impacted by factory farming. So... So we see here animals are the main one we tend to think of, but it's also an environmental issue, a social justice issue, and a public health issue. And I was so struck by the effectiveness of putting the full picture together. When you, when you talk about all the different facets of factory farming, there's just no way to argue with it. It's clearly bad in just about every conceivable way. And so I wanted to find a way to get that information out there to people. I looked around, and, you know, there's tons of fantastic groups that are approaching factory farming as an animal welfare, animal rights issue, but I didn't see very many groups that were taking this holistic approach and talking not just about animals, but also about, you know, social justice, the environment, health, all these other important issues. And so I founded our organization and put together a PowerPoint presentation that has different sections devoted to all of these different causes. So cornerstone of our work is taking this very holistic approach that allows us to reach these wider audiences. We have over a dozen versions of our presentation that are tailored towards these different groups. So some of them, you know, focus 
uh, more on social justice and then on the environment. We can even relate it to gender studies, government econ. I mean, it's almost endless when you start to really dig into all of the things that are impacted by the food system. This approach has been very successful. So just so far in 2016, we've spoken over 16,000 people. We've reached over 26,000 people in the last three years. And we're speaking primarily to college students, high school students. We do also speak as well to faith communities, community groups like Rotary Clubs, also businesses. I've spoken to several tech companies um, in the Bay Area. So we reach, reach, again, a very wide variety of people. So that's the background where I'm coming from, what my experience is as an activist and as someone who's really trying to build bridges with these other communities and engage them, engage people in ways that relate directly to what they already care about um, to most effectively win them over to um, build these commonalities so that we can work on this issue together. Because as I'm sure all of you know, animal agribusiness is an incredibly powerful industry. And so if we are actually going to make change, we need every single ally that we can get. So we really need to find these commonalities and find ways that we can work together to build our strength. So that's what will be framing my talk today. And I often give this talk to people who are interested in joining our group and giving presentations. So a lot of what we do is public speaking. So some of this, you'll see like public speaking tips is kind of geared towards that. But these basic principles can really be applied to all different forms of activism. So one of the most important things is framing your message. And this requires knowing your audience. So as I mentioned, we have all these different versions of our presentation that are tailored towards these different audiences. But again, even if you are not going out and giving presentations, just when you're talking to people one-on-one, -on -one, it's also really important to know your audience and to keep in mind what motivates that person, what's important to them. And if you don't know this information offhand, it's good to ask questions. So how many of you have had interactions, maybe challenging interactions with people where they were you know, asked me, you maybe asked you why you're vegan or asked you about some part of this and it felt uncomfortable. Yeah, okay, <laughs> looks like almost all of us. It can be really awkward, right? I mean, I still have these interactions and sometimes I feel uncomfortable in those one-on-one -on -one levels. But one of the best ways to go about it is to try to make it about the other person and frame it in terms that they're going to relate to and they're going to care about. And so one of the best ways to do this is to start off by asking questions. So. Obviously, if they ask you, why are you vegan, you start off making it about yourself. But as much as you can, you want to ask them, like, you know, what made you interested in learning about veganism? Or what's motivating to you? You know, are you interested in your health? Is it more the animals? Is it the environment? You know, you can ask them. You can be upfront. Try to, again, know your audience, know who you're speaking to, and figure out what's important to them. And again, you might know this from your history with the person, or if it's someone that you're encountering um, meaning for the first time, you might not know it, but as much as you can use that Socratic method, um, it's good for you because then you can tailor your message to them. It's also good to get them thinking because then they'll have to ask themselves, am I someone who cares about animals? Do I choose what foods I eat based on the environment if I you know, identify as an environmentalist? So just asking those questions will get that person thinking in a very non-confrontational way. So this is one of the most important things that you can do regardless of who you're speaking to. And then based on that information, you want to tailor the information that you're giving them. So obviously, if you know the person you're speaking to is a diehard environmentalist, you're probably not going to be talking about the health benefits of being veg, right? You want to relate to what motivates them the most. And the other part of this, um, it can be tricky because Let's say you know that the person you're talking to or the audience you're speaking to um, are environmentalists. It can be tempting to say, did you know that you know, animal agriculture is one of the leading causes of greenhouse gas emissions and water pollution and deforestation? It's causing all of these problems. And what that can do sometimes is make the person feel defensive. And when that happens, they can shut down, and it's really hard to get through to them. So the better thing to do is to relate it back to yourself. So rather than saying, did you know this and did you know that, which can sound kind of scolding or intense, might make them be like, whoa, it can be like, yeah, I really care about the environment too. And I was shocked to learn that animal agriculture makes more greenhouse gases than all the transportation in the world combined. And so that way, it's a subtle shift, but you're making it about yourself and you're, you're showing them that I used to not know this information too. 
I, just like you, also care about the environment, and I also used to not know these things, and I was really shocked when I did learn that. And then based on that information, I made these changes to how I eat. And so rather than putting that person on the defensive, they're going to feel like you understand them and you're on the same page. And that makes them much more likely to identify with you and to feel comfortable continuing to talk with you about this, which then increases the chances that you're going to be successful in getting them to change their behavior. So knowing your audience is very important, um, but it's also about being able to then use that information to relate to them in a way that um, builds a connection between you rather than making them feel defensive. All right, which gets us into um, what, again, are public speaking tips, but also work for one-on-one -on -one conversations, talking to groups, leafleting, whatever your chosen form of outreach might be. And often this is scary, right? So um, especially for most people, getting up in front of audiences or even in front of groups is really anxiety-provoking. Public speaking is the leading um, fear in the United States. So one of the, uh, just a really quick tip that you can do to overcome anxiety, there's a great TED talk about this, but actually power posing is what it's called. So great example of it here. But, um, you know, holding these like really like powerful, victorious poses, taking up a lot of space. There's um, research that shows that that actually helps to decrease um, our cortisol levels and increase our testosterone levels. So it makes us feel less stressed more confident, and so this is, you don't want to do it in front of the audience, I know I did that today, but <laughs> um, <laughs> there you go, great. <laughs> um, so this is something, you know, if you're going to go out leafleting and you're really nervous about it, maybe in your car, or like before you leave your house, you can do this. It's also great even for non-advocacy um, types of situations, if you're going to a job interview or something like that. Anything where you feel nervous is a good, quick confidence booster, so just a fun little tip for you. Uh, posture is another big thing. So, you know, does this guy, does he look super welcoming and confident? Probably not. So, I guess you can't um, turn the mic, but, you know, so if I'm, if I'm standing up in front of you like this, then what's the impression that you get? Do I look like I want to be here? Do I look like someone you're going to trust to give you honest information? Probably not. So, um, <laughs> okay, so, um, this is something, and again, this works in front of audiences or even just in small group conversations because the same um, social cues, people pick up on them regardless of the situation. So you want to have a really open, neutral posture. So just planting your feet, like hip width apart, having your hands at your side so that they can come up and gesture. Um, you're, you're grounded, you're solid, and it's really neutral, so it's not going to distract from what you're saying. So do I look pretty natural? Yeah. So... This, um, again, great to practice, even just one-on-one -on -one situations, and it just, I mean, subconscious, but feeling grounded will also help give you more confidence. Eye contact, another critical thing. So I'm sure we've all been in situations where the presenter was not making eye contact and the audience ends up looking like this, right? If I'm talking to you and I'm just kind of gazing around to the side, up at the ceiling, I'm not connecting with you, right? You feel like maybe I'm being shifty, either I'm nervous or I don't really believe in what I'm saying, I don't like you. You know, there's a lot of different assumptions that we might make, but none of them are good. And again, this applies to speaking to audiences, but also one-on-one -on -one interactions. And this can be tricky if we're feeling nervous, right? We've all heard that idea that you should look above the heads of people if you're scared. But then you're going to miss a huge opportunity to connect with them because, I mean, eye contact is such a primal human experience. That's how we make connections with the people that we're talking with, and that is going to be critical in getting them to listen to us, to believe in us, to want to engage in, you know, whether it's a presentation or a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So this is something just to kind of keep in the back of your mind. You might not even realize that you're doing it, but a lot of us, if we're nervous, we might have a tendency to be kind of looking around, looking up, looking down. So just Try to think about that when you're having these conversations to make sure that you're really fully engaged and you're using that opportunity just to connect with your audience. The tone is also critically important, and this is one that is really hard for a lot of activists because, I mean, we know the horrors that are going on. We know the scale of the suffering, and we're angry, right? I mean, we have a reason to be angry. There's billions of animals suffering and dying horrific deaths on a daily basis. 
And it's easy for this anger and this frustration to creep into our voice when we're talking to people about these issues. But no one wants to be scolded for 45 minutes, right? Um, it's, and again, this applies whether public speaking or just these one-on-one -on -one or one-to-a-little-group conversations that people, if they feel like you're judging them, if they feel like you're scolding them, again, they're going to back off. They're going to not want to engage with you. They're going to get defensive or they're going to get angry, feel like you're you know, patronizing them. And so this doesn't create a good groundwork to have those open conversations that are what actually lead to behavior change. So there's a really fine line. I mean, it's, it's important that we have these emotions. You know, we don't have to be dishonest about that. This is what's, you know, it's a driving passion for I'm sure all of us are in this room because we care so deeply about this issue. And we don't have to hide that. You know, it's, it's powerful for people to see that we do care so deeply about this and it does touch us so deeply. But we want to make sure that we're channeling that into um, honest emotions rather than uh, anger that can feel like judgment. So, you know, if you're talking about this, it's okay even if you get a little choked up. You can say, you know what? Sorry, just let me take a breath. I care so much about this issue that sometimes it's hard for me to talk about it without getting, without feeling upset. And if you say that, you know, the person you're talking with or the audience is going to think, wow, you know, she's really passionate. I really admire that. And she's being really honest with me. She's being open with me. And I respect that. And, you know, you're opening the lines of communication versus if you're just, you know, saying, how, how could you contribute to this? Like, don't you know that animals are dying? And that's, people are going to be like, whoa, <laughs> I can't. You know, it's, it's too intense. And so that's, the again, that fine line to walk between letting your emotions show in an honest way that can help build those connections versus having it come out as anger and frustration that the other person will feel like it's a reaction um, to themselves and then they'll get defensive. So, the main, you know, one of our main goals is to build those open channels of communication, and it's critical to make, uh, make sure that people don't feel defensive because then they will just shut down. And another thing, again, both for public speaking and just for one-on-one -on -one activism, conversations with friends or um, little groups of people if you're leafleting, things like that, practice really helps. So especially for public speaking, practicing whatever your speech is will help make you feel more confident. But this is also true for those conversations. So again, it seemed like almost all of us have had those conversations that were tricky, we felt uncomfortable, we didn't know what to say, and practice is great for those. So if you have another friend who's vegan, if you have another activist, even role-playing that can be really great because it's hard in the, in the moment when we, you know, there's so much pressure, we feel like we have to say the perfect thing right then. It's our one chance to get the person to go veg. If we say the wrong thing, then we blew it, and, you know, they're going to keep eating animals for the rest of their lives. You know, how many of you have had that, you kind of feel that way when you have these conversations, right? But, I mean, obviously, first of all, that's not true. <laughs> um, so even if you don't give the perfect answer, any conversation that um, is, you know, getting them thinking about this more is good. So don't kick yourself if you feel like you didn't give the perfect answer. But um, all of that stress in the moment makes it harder for us to give that perfect answer, right? So if you practice these things with um, friends or family, someone who's supportive, it can help you to stay calm in the moment. And rather than having that knee-jerk reaction or getting kind of choked up, then you can remember, oh, yeah, you know, it, during that role play, it went really well when instead of just firing facts off at them, I asked them about this, and then I shared this story. So, again, you know, whether for the small interactions, public speaking, the more that you've had practice talking about these things and working out the different scenarios, the more likely it is that the conversations will be very positive. All right. So another part of this is overcoming fear. And I talked about it a little bit with posture. But how many of us have felt like this, right? We feel like we have to talk to people. Pretty terrifying, right? <laughs> and the, there is a lot of really subtle psychological assumptions that underpin this fear. So whether it's getting up, again, in front of audiences or talking to a friend about our food choices, we may not realize it, but we have these subconscious assumptions that affect our view of the situation, which can make us feel a lot more nervous. So, for instance, some of these might be about ourselves, that, you know, I'm not good at public speaking or I'm not a good voice for the animals. I get too choked up and so I can't say the right things. It might be about the audience, like these people don't care. They're just meat eaters. They're part of the problem. Or it might be about the message. You know, this is too radical. 
it's going to overwhelm them, they're not going to relate to it, whatever it might be. And it can be really powerful for us to take a few minutes and really analyze what those assumptions are that we're carrying around. Because, I mean, we do this about any situation, and we usually don't realize it, but it can really impact how we behave. So, to give you an example, let's say that you're in a cafe or you're in a vegan restaurant, and, you know, some cute-looking person walks in the door. Now, your assumptions about yourself and about that person are really going to impact how you're going to react. So, if you think, God, I'm having such a bad hair day, or I'm way too shy to talk to that person, you're probably not going to talk to them, right? Or if you do, it might be awkward, and you're looking down because you don't feel self-confident, and so the chances that there could be a positive outcome of that are pretty low. Whereas if your assumption is, oh, hey, you know, we're both in a vegan restaurant. We have something in common. Um, or like, oh, I'm wearing my favorite shirt today. It's a perfect opportunity. Whatever it might be, if you have those positive assumptions, you're more likely to take actions that have positive outcomes. So just a basic principle that applies really in any social situation. So if you can take a few minutes and try to identify what it is that makes you uncomfortable when you're doing outreach? What is it that you're scared of about yourself, about the person, about the message? Um, try to isolate that and then try to find a way to flip that to a positive assumption. So if you think, oh, I'm, you know, I get too scared talking about these issues, you can think, well, I'm scared because I really care so much about this. I don't want to do something wrong. I don't want to say the wrong thing. And then that's actually really powerful because the fact that you care so much is huge. That means that you're actually a really great person to talk about this because it's something that you're passionate about. So you can think, you know, this is really important to me. And that's a, a positive way to frame it that will, again, be empowering and make a more positive impact. And so, I mean, a lot of this is framed towards giving presentations, but in front of students or in front of community groups, one of the things that I like to think about um, is that the people are there because they're interested in this information. And that's true, too, of one-on-one -on -one conversations. If someone has asked you a question, even if it's kind of a random or hostile question, they're still interested in this, right? I mean, it's not like you just grabbed some random person off the street and started yelling facts at them. Someone asked you a question, you're responding to it. And so they're interested, you know. And that in itself is a positive thing. So if you just keep that in mind, if we're having this conversation because they're interested in learning more about it, thinking more about it, then you can come from that positive place. All right, so the other really tricky thing can be those random, hostile, sometimes questions that we get. Um, I'm sure we've all had these, you know, whether from a, a family member over dinner or, you know, Facebook comments or people, you know, sometimes even friends. Um, but, you know, what if you were stranded on a desert island and, you know, what if a cow was hugged to death? I actually had someone ask me that once. Um, I mean, I'm sure we could all tell these stories of super bizarre questions that we get. And, you know, it's, it's easy to get angry in response and be like, why are you being a jerk? This is really, a, you know, it's, it's important to me. Why are you taking this seriously? Don't you know animals are dying? That's often our, you know, emotional response. But again, you have to really keep in mind that even if it seems hostile, they're asking this question because they're thinking about this issue. Even if it's coming from a very bizarre place, at least they're thinking about it. So you want to then take that energy and redirect it into a more productive conversation. So a good example is um, this argument about whether or not humans were made to eat meat. So I've seen people talk about this for like an hour. You know, they're each quoting different anthropologists, and it can get very heated, and I've never seen it go anywhere productive. Um, people almost never change people's minds or walk away from that. Um, you know, they just basically are butting heads. And it's really tempting in all different kinds of interactions. We have this tendency to want to win arguments, right? Um, especially with, like, parents. So there's certain kinds of people, if we're used to debating, we're used to wanting to, like, you know, disprove everything that they say. And every little point we want to prove that we're right and they're wrong which is, it's tempting and it feels good when we're able to do it, but it doesn't change people's behavior. It makes them angry so that when you're talking, they're just thinking about ways to rebut what you're saying, or it makes them defensive and then they just disengage. So we want to instead take the gist of what they're asking us and redirect it in a way that can result in productive conversations. So for instance, that question about being stranded on a desert island, you know, 
if you were if you're stranded on a desert island with just a cow, would you eat that cow or would you not? And um, so what I like to say is, you know, I don't know what I would do if I was stranded on a desert island. It's hard for me to say. I've never been in that situation. But what I do know is that, you know, I'm lucky to be living in a time and place where I have I can eat or, you know, I can be super healthy and happy on a totally plant-based diet where no animals have to die to sustain my lifestyle. Or you can bring it back to, you know, we're not on a desert island. We're in a place where 9 billion animals are factory farmed every year to produce our meat. So whatever, like, if you have a, a core point that you want to bring it back to, which is usually either, like, about factory farming or about how happy and healthy and easy it is to, to be on a veg diet, um, if you can just keep bringing it back to that, then eventually the person is going to realize, okay, I'm not going to be able to fluster this person with all of my stupid theoretical questions. And then at that point, either they'll stop asking you questions or they might start asking you real questions um, that can lead to really productive conversations. And um, a really great story that um, our Los Angeles director, Nora Kramer, um, who runs Youth Empowered Action Camp, she, um, she has a friend who... Um, when he was in college, he was an omnivore, and he would see the animal rights group tabling every day, and he thought, God, those people are so stupid. Like, who would care about animal rights? That's ridiculous. And so he would go up every day, and he would ask them these stupid questions, and they would answer really seriously. You know, they would take it seriously. They would give him these very calm responses. They would bring it back to all these issues. And eventually he ran out of ridiculous questions to ask, and realized these are not stupid people after all. There's, you know, they're onto something. And so, long story short, he went on to become vegan and work for PETA. So, <laughs> so you really never know. I mean, these people who start out by asking these hostile questions, it's just because they're just starting to engage with these issues. And, I mean, we all know how much misinformation there is out there, how much propaganda people are raised with for their entire lives. And so it's important to think about that and have empathy for people when we are dealing with these what can be really frustrating or annoying questions. And related to that, it's really important also to find common ground. And again, this is a great technique for any kind of interaction that you're having with anybody. So again, often with family members or random commenters on Facebook or, you know, audience members, whatever it might be. Again, to resist that urge to just go at it and try to disprove everything that they're saying, prove that you're right, see if there's anything in what that person is saying that you can actually agree with. Because they're looking for a fight, right? Or they're anticipating that you're going to hate them or whatever. You know, they're, they're anticipating a conflict. And so if you agree with them, they're going to be like, wait, what? Like, I thought, I thought we were going to argue here. This person's agreeing with me. Um, and that... Kind of, it throws them off balance, but by establishing this common ground, it's much more likely that you will actually be able to have a productive conversation. So it's no longer an argument. It's more of a kind of exploratory feeling out where the other person's coming from, which can, is much more likely to lead to a productive outcome. So to give a good example of this, the, I mean, the, one of the most contentious issues is humane meat, right? I'm sure we've all dealt with this. It's super frustrating. A lot of vegans regard this as, like, the main enemy. And so it can be tempting if someone says, I mean, I, I used to live in the Bay Area, so I get this all the time. Um, common in Portland, too, where people say, you know, oh, I don't, I don't eat factory farm meat. I only eat humane, sustainable, grass-fed, blah, blah, blah. And I know it's, it's frustrating because we know that that's a lie, right, um, by and large. And we know that that doesn't really... You know, the animals are still suffering. Often they're still coming from factory farms. And so it can be tempting to say, you know, oh, either you're still being lied to. I know someone who said you might as well be buying factory farm meat. Um, you're not doing any good. It's easy to, to react and have that, that negative interaction. But if we stop and think about it, there's a huge common ground between us and people who are buying humane, sustainable, whatever it is. Right? Because it means they're thinking about where their food is coming from. They're going out of their way to find these certain products, and they're paying more for them. And they're not, they're doing that because they care about animals and or they care about the environment. So that's huge common ground. I mean, comparing that to someone who's going to McDonald's and has never given a second thought to where their burger came from before it hit their plate, I mean, that's a lot of really powerful interests in common. And so rather than 
judging them for that action and having a negative response that's going to make them feel defensive. Because, I mean, you know, people do spend a considerable amount of time and money getting these products. And so if we suddenly say to them, you know, you're, you're a fool, you've been lied to, or you've been wasting your time and your money, people don't want to hear that. You know, they don't, there's going to be a defensive reaction to that because they're not going to want to admit that. But instead, if you say, oh, you know, that's, that's really great that you're thinking about where your food is coming from. What was it that made you interested in not buying factory farm products? Again, if we ask those questions and we start to have that dialogue, figure out, again, knowing your audience and knowing whether it's animals or the environment that's motivating them, then, you know, you haven't, it's, again, it's a fine line because saying, you know, it's great that you care about where your food is coming from. You're not saying humane farms are great. You're saying that your intentions are good, and it's good that you're thinking about this. So that's, you know, you see the difference. It's, you don't have to affirm something you don't believe in. It's trying to find what do you have in common with them, and then give them really positive affirmation of that. So once you do that, then again, you can start to ask these questions, figure out what's important to them, and then based on that, you can have those conversations. So, you know, if they really care about the environment, you can say, Something like, yeah, you know, I, I'm an environmentalist too, and I was really shocked when I learned about factory farming, and I realized that there's, there's actually not enough land for all of us to eat um, free-range meat three times a day. That's the main, the main argument against, like, free-range sustainable meat from an environmental perspective, is you can't um, sustainably raise 9 billion animals. That's just not possible. So we would, you know, to actually switch that system, everyone would have to eat dramatically less meat. So finding kind of a gentle way to introduce that idea, again, framed around your own realization rather than theirs, is a really good way to address that. So that's just one example. That's probably the hardest example for a lot of us because it brings up such um, strong emotions. But I mean, same thing is true for even um, another thing that comes up that can be hard to deal with is, oh, man, but I love bacon. Or, like, you know, I, meat tastes so good. Right? We get that all the time. And, again, it's easy to be like, you know, is your taste really more important than the, you know, rape and death? Of, you know, it's, I mean, it's true. Like, it sounds like people are being facetious. It's, it's literally true. But that is not going to win anyone over because it sounds, for someone who doesn't know the issues, it sounds like you're exaggerating. Um, and also, you know, that anger is going to make them defensive. It's not going to lead to productive things. Whereas, I mean, most of us, I'm assuming, weren't born veg, right? We weren't born vegan. And so, I mean, almost all of us, unless anyone was, we have enjoyed the taste of meat, right? I used to go to Jack in the Box. I loved fast food when I was a kid. And so we do have something in common. Like, we have that common ground. So rather than judging them for that, you can say, I love meat, too. I mean, you know, it's not the taste that I'm opposed to. It's, it's how those products are made. And you can even, I mean, if this is remotely true, you can say something like, yeah, you know, when I first went veg, I was kind of worried that I was going to miss all these products. I was going to get cravings. But then I discovered all these awesome, you know, like field roast and gardein. And I, I learned about all these awesome products and awesome restaurants. So I still eat burgers and I still eat hot dogs. I still get the same taste, but I feel a lot better about where they're coming from. Something like that. So again, you know, it's not, you're not clashing, you're not judging the person, you're relating to them and saying, yeah, of course, we all want to eat food that tastes good, you know. It's not, it, it can seem ridiculous because we know what's behind it, but I mean, it's something that we all share. So again, that, it, it takes time and it, often there's a fine line to it, but if you can find anything in what the other person is saying that you can agree with um, and build from there, you're going to be so much more likely to have this um, really productive, positive conversation. Okay, so those are the, the basic tips, and I wanted to leave plenty of time because um, I thought maybe um, people in the audience would have some particular questions or situations you've dealt with that have been really difficult and you haven't known how to respond. Um, we, I do these activism trainings a lot. It's usually with smaller groups, but I mean, it, it, this is hard stuff, right? And so I think it can help to have a supportive environment for us to to kind of work through these things together. So I wanted to leave um, plenty of time for questions. Um, before I get into that, though, I just want to say again, we are the Factory Farming Awareness Coalition. It's our website, email address, and what we do, our whole focus, as I said in the beginning, is um, doing this education to community groups, schools, faith communities, businesses, and we love to get referrals. So if any of you in the audience are connected to um, schools or businesses, community groups that you think might be interested in hosting a talk, We'd love to come speak. As I mentioned, we have different versions that are tailored towards different audiences. 
also, I mean, what we can do if you live locally, if you really want to get this info to your friends or family, um, but don't feel comfortable talking about it yourself, I have, I can speak like, sometimes we'll do like a potluck. I've spoken to neighborhood groups where someone will say, yeah, I wanted to bring this and the speaker. And that way we can deliver the information for you without you having to have all those awkward conversations. So um, if you're interested in inviting us to come speak to any classes or groups, you can come talk to me afterwards. We also have a table um, in the exhibit hall. So just wanted to get that out there. Feel free to take a photo if you want to reach out to us. Um, and with that said, I'll open up to any questions. Thank you. is there's so many different forms that advocacy can take. And leafleting is a really fantastic one. That's how I got started, too, um, with vegan outreach, handing out leaflets on a college campus. And it is really fun. It's, it's a little scary at first, but it becomes like a game almost, trying to see how many you get out and where to go to position yourself just right. Leafleting is really awesome, but even just personal advocacy can be really effective. And, you know, so I, I went vegan when I was 18, and I was a, you know, a headstrong college student. And so when I went home, I would fight with my mom because she would go to the store and buy chicken. And I'd say, how can you eat that? You know, telling her all the gory details. And we just had all these fights. And eventually I gave up because it didn't go anywhere. And then she, so fast forward seven years later, she actually went vegan. And it was just through the, the positive example that I was setting. Because over time, she saw that I was sticking with it. She saw that I was healthy. She was trying more and more of these foods. And so with friends and family, sometimes it seems like nothing's happening, but you're actually setting a really powerful, positive example just by being happy, just by exposing them to delicious foods. So um, that alone is a, is a powerful form of advocacy that I think often we don't give ourselves enough credit for. And again, um, food activism, so much fun and so positive, so easy. So um, like I know of, I have a friend who did a, he did a chicken sandwich day at work where he brought in a bunch of garden for everybody and he had different toppings. And so his coworkers all made their own sandwiches and they were super impressed with the food. So something like that, no one's going to get angry if you're giving them free food. So that's another like very low conflict way to set an example. Um, we also used to do almond milk sampling, um, which now, I mean, so many people in Portland buy almond milk. I don't know if there's even a need for this anymore, but um, a lot of people would be like, you know, I was curious about this, but I didn't want to commit to buying an entire package of it in case I didn't like it. So just giving them those little samples, another great way to go about it. Um, yeah, and again, um, leafleting, inviting us to come speak, um, online advocacy. There's so many different ways that you can really have a difference. Um, movie screenings, another great way, like, you know, invite some friends over to watch Forks Over Knives, arrange a screening at your local library or your local school. A lot of great different things that we can do. Yeah. <laughs> Expected to be able to come up with the rebuttal to everything um, at, a, at a 
I usually, if I see that there's no opportunity, this person is really just trying to hassle us, um, I'll just try to disengage and get them to go away. Because the more time that you're spending dealing with one troublemaker in a public situation like that, the less time you're going to have to engage with people who might actually be open to what you're saying. So um, tabling, demos, leafleting, that kind of thing, if someone is really just harassing you, you want to disengage and end that conversation as quickly as possible. If it's a friend or a family member, which does happen to a lot of people sometimes, um, again, if you've, if you've tried these methods and you've tried to kind of get them by redirecting, get them to like a more honest, serious conversation and they're just not willing to go there, sometimes they are just being mean. You know, sometimes they do just want to make fun of you. And I think in those circumstances, it's okay to say, you know what, these are really important issues to me. This is, this is really serious and it's something that's like very important to me. Um, to my identity, to the work that I do, and so I don't appreciate you joking about it. And I've talked to a lot of people who have, you know, like a brother or cousin or whatever who always, like, make fun of them, and a lot of times they're really taken aback because they've never even thought about the fact that it might actually hurt our feelings if they're making fun of us all the time. So, you know, again, it, it depends on the situation. Obviously, that's not going to work with some random hostile person at a rodeo protest, but friends and family, sometimes you can try to go there and be like, you know, if you want to have an open, serious conversation about this, I'm really willing, but I don't want to spend my energy, you know, defending myself anymore with something that's as important to me. Yeah, I mean, if you use these techniques, like if you try to redirect them or ask them a couple questions, and I mean, the more you do it, the more you can get a feel for it. I mean, sometimes you can kind of tell almost immediately that the person is really hostile and not going to engage. Um, but yeah, if you've tried this a little bit and it's not working and you're in a situation where you could be talking to lots of other people in that time, then yeah, I would just disengage as quickly as possible. Yeah. Yeah, conversation by very effective but we managed to get that connection and people tend to reduce their meat and they have a product consumption. Um, I have not had as great success in situations where I'm in a larger group of friends and they sort of get into the group mentality of like, oh, since we we're in the you know the majority we're in the majority here, we like uh, we're, we're gonna be in the right no matter what you say. Do you have any advice for those situations for a very 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 um trying to get this across to multiple people at the same moment? That can definitely be tricky, especially if that mentality that you've talked about takes hold. Um, I think kind of the same thing applies, like you know, kind of try to feel it out, like bring it back to yourself and what's important to you and how like you feel really great with this and it's like you know it's an issue that you take seriously and you feel good knowing you're making a difference, something like that. But, I mean, unless people are really jerks, they're not going to, like, try to make fun of you for that. Um, if you if this is something that happens a lot, if it's kind of a recurring scenario and you know a certain group of friends is always going to joke about it when they're in a group, same kind of thing. It might not be productive to try to sway them when they're in a group, but maybe later on, one-on-one, -on -one, you can be like, hey, you know, I remember you asked me about this thing or, like, you were talking about greenhouse gases or whatever it is and trying then to like get them one-on-one -on -one to have those more productive conversations rather than trying to confront them in a group might be more effective. Yeah, please do. Yeah, and yeah, if anyone has experience with this that works well, then please share. Yeah, I feel like
this is with friends, I think it depends on your knowledge of those friends. So there totally are some people out there, especially the more, like, philosophically, like, utilitarian-minded people, where sometimes that can totally work for you to call them out and be like, hey, you know, you're all about logic. This is an inconsistency in your logic. So with some people, I think that can work, especially if it's with friends and you know how they think and how they argue. But I think in a lot of other people, that could just make them defensive and kind of shut down the conversation. Um, so, yeah, again, I mean, this stuff is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, and that, yeah, again, like with friends especially, I think it really helps to keep in mind, again, knowing your audience, what, it, what changes this person's mind, what gets them to switch from joking and being a jerk to, like, actually thinking about it seriously, kind of keep that in the back of your head to, or, or maybe, you know, maybe nothing does make them switch in a social situation, and it's not going to be worth any of your time to, to do that in a group because they're just going to end up joking about it. So, yeah. true that it's not good to talk about this over food if people are eating animal products, and if that is true, then, then what do you do about it? So I do agree with that. There's a psychological concept of cognitive dissonance, that people don't like their actions to not be in line with their beliefs, and that creates this tension, and so ideally they will stop their actions to be in line with their beliefs, but more often what happens is they're hostile or they reject it or, you know, they kind of want to defend this. And so that makes it harder to engage in those productive conversations. And I think, you know, if someone is learning how bad an agriculture is, like while biting into a burger, it's very much cognitive dissonance. And so they're going to try to lash out most likely. So I do agree with that. Um, the advice that I've heard given that I think is best is just to be upfront. Like, you know, I, I would love to talk to you more about this, but it's kind of awkward to talk about it while we're eating these products, so maybe it'd be better to talk about it after dinner. And, you know, if there is if there is time um, to talk about it in a group afterwards, and that's best. Otherwise, maybe you can talk to that person about it one-on-one -on -one at a time when you're not eating. Do so you have a, situ a suggestion? Or... Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. curious about it, I'd be happy to talk to you about it later. Like, be really upfront and positive about it. Sometimes that can help kind of, like, either put an end to it or, or make it less awkward. Did you have a suggestion, Diane? I hear some video on YouTube right now. It's often done a lot of them, I guess, and how to get along without going along. And he says, it's a way for us to tell them in an awkward situation where people didn't care about where your choosing not to go and how to get along with the right now. So you can say, like, tell me why you have trouble with this issue, or, you know, why, 
why don't you want to know what is it about it that makes you uncomfortable? So, uh, yeah, that's a really great suggestion. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 